The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Ion Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz, along with former Oshkosh Mayor and City Councilwoman Melanie Bleckel. About a month ago, we had on Oshkosh School Board President Dennis McHugh, and uh, following the airing of that program, we heard from several teachers within the Oshkosh Area School District who felt that some of Mr. McHugh's comments uh, with respect to teacher pay, teacher contracts, that type of thing, um, were not necessarily uh, entirely accurate. Um, some of it uh, may have been a little bit one-sided, they felt, and um, we asked if they would like to have an opportunity to come on the show and present their position on things, and uh, we are very grateful that two uh, faculty members have agreed to do that. Joining us on this edition are Oshkosh West High School teacher Tom Wissink, to my immediate left, and Oshkosh West High School guidance counselor Dave Lynch, to my very far left, thank you very, <laughs> mo for, very much for uh, both being here this evening. Well, we we appreciate yeah. that. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Tom, we're going to start off, uh, I, I guess, by maybe just both of you telling our audience a little bit about how long you've worked within the district, um, specifically what you do. I mean, we don't need a, an hour-by-hour hour description okay. or anything sure. like that, but just kind of give an overview of, of what do you teach, what you do, that type of thing. Okay, I am um, at Oshkosh West High School, teach uh, social studies. Uh, right now, teaching most of the uh, geography classes, um, or my schedule is all geography classes. I also, uh, I've been in the district eight years as a teacher. I coach wrestling, um, helping out with football this year, volunteering, coaching, uh, involved in several committees, clubs, um, help out, you know, supervising, you know, whatever else I can um, do. So I got my hand in a lot of different things with the school district. Okay. Thankfully, you're young. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for now, for yeah. now, yeah. yeah. Getting older. I, well, I have a, I'm not the, my daughter is a freshman this year, so oh I don't my. feel wow. as young anymore. And he said daughter. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what about you? What's um, I'm a counselor at West. Um, I've been here since my fourth year. Um, this year, I have almost all of the seniors. Um, we did a change this year, and we're set up by grade level. And so I have 420 of the 460 some seniors that are assigned to me. And as their counselor, I help them with academic issues, um, planning for college or military or technical school or different careers. But I also do the social emotional type thing, dealing with family, friends, alcohol, drug use, sexual type things, um, depression, suicide. So it's kind of like it's, it's split in three areas. It's the vocational, it's a social, and it's emotional. And helping kids kind of navigate through that and helping their parents. Because a lot of our parents, it's their first time through with a child. They themselves may not have graduated high school or have gone on for more training. And it's kind of helping parents parent their kids. And so I do a lot of that as well. In addition, I'm also a student council advisor. This is my third year with that group. And we do things like uh, the citywide lip sync, which is shown on OCAD um, mm -hmm. from time to time, um, as well as the blood drives and homecoming activities and those type things. Then I also um, coordinate a program called Project West, which has been seen in Northwestern a couple times recently. And that's a transition program helping eighth graders transition to high school. It's a mentoring program with upperclassmen mentors who are trained to work with the new students. Okay. Now, because you are a guidance counselor, mm -hmm. do you have to have a higher level of education Correct. than a teacher would? Correct. Um, I have, in order to be a guidance counselor in this state, you need a master's degree in counseling with a uh, focus on schools. Um, and then. Um, other states require a teaching degree along with that, although Wisconsin just requires um, a provisional license period where I'm under supervision for uh, my first two or three years to get certified. 
Okay. All right. Um, well, one of the issues that, um, you know, Tom, you had contacted me. You were one of the folks mm -hmm. who had contacted me by email um, shortly after the, the show with Mr. McHugh aired. And you did say um, that uh, while some of the information was very good and, and well presented, of course, it, there was some of it that you felt was maybe a, a little inaccurate or one-sided and um, y you know you went into some of those details we certainly want to give you an opportunity as well as you Dave to you know to talk about the things that you felt were one-sided or not entirely represented you know the way they should be um, but one of the things in particular um, that I guess we could maybe start there is that Mr. McHugh stated on the show that the state requires 180 days of actual face-to-face -face instruction, that being where teachers are actually in front of students, hence the face-to-face -face terminology. Mm -hmm. um, but according to Mr. McHugh, five of those 180 days were being used for in-service. Mm -hmm. Now, when you and I discussed that on the phone, Tom, you had said that that was not entirely accurate. And so maybe there would be a good place for us to start. What exactly, I mean, obviously we can't change the 180 face-to-face -face days. That's what the Department of Education in Wisconsin requires. How many face-to-face -face days of instruction are the students really getting according to your contract? The, that part is, that's correct. It was approved um, last night, I believe, by the school board by a four to three vote. And they approved the calendar, which is 175 face-to-face -face days. Um, Isn't it 174? It's a... Uh, I think it's 174 and a half. And a half. Is what it comes out to, and the DPI recognizes it as 175. Um, the part that I thought wasn't, it came across when I was watching your show that that was what teachers were were working. And, and a little bit, um, it not getting, I felt like we're not getting the, uh, the uh, whole use of collaboration time out there so that people understood what was going on. The contract is 191 days, okay? So teachers are working 191 days. Like you said, 100, or, or uh, Melanie, um, 174 and a half, which the DPI recognizes as 175 face-to-face -face days. Um, to go back a little bit, what I know, and uh, you know, and there's people that were involved that know a lot more than I do, but from what I understand, um, this whole all began with the budget crisis and when the um, school board and different committees and that were trying to look at ways to save money. Um, so a committee was formed, I mean board members and uh, union members, um, administration. So you had these, all these different groups come together and, and one way it looked at um, how to save money in the calendar. Uh, looking at other districts, what they did is they, they shortened the face-to-face -face days and, and lengthened the school day and by that way you're cutting down on your transportation costs and food service and things like that. And they're actually able to save a little bit of money for the district doing that. And in the same time, we've been having a, uh, and I know our principal Tom Parker is, is uh, very much uh, leading the way on this too, is looking at ways to work in collaboration or, or training um, for the teachers. And so it was a way also to build in five days to do that mm -hmm. um, and that's what happened so it went so those five days it did go down for face-to-face -face instruction the school day lengthened so the minute I don't know what the minutes how they come out you know roughly the same say to what was last year because the day is a little bit longer um, and it, it did increase the in-service days to five days what I guess what well, I have uh, my question is 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 it not counterproductive and contradictory if, if your interest is to educate students and mm -hmm. my interest as a parent is to get my kid educated, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Why would you cut down on face-to-face -face days to teach my child? With, sure. In 174 and a half days, they have to learn a plethora of information mm -hmm. on a multitude of subjects that exactly. many of them, of them, eighth graders going to freshman year, the failure rate for freshmen mm -hmm. is staggering. Sure. I mean, it's staggering. So why would you cut down on face-to-face -face days to save money? Sure. Well, actually, there's two ways of, of <coughs> looking at that, or many ways, obviously. But from my understanding of the situation, and again, 
you could have a third grade teacher, Emmeline Cook, sitting here giving a whole different perspective. But again, from my pers perspective from West, um, one or two ways looking at it, the cost is an issue. And when we serve the master, the taxpayer who wants to save on money, we've got to start trimming somewhere. And the taxpayers would say, well, save the money, we'll do what you can. And to keep in mind, a lot of taxpayers don't have kids in the district, so they may be looking only at the dollar sign, not on your child or your child or your daughter who's a freshman or whatever. And so that's one of the issues. The other issue is, is what's the quality or what's the content of stuff being taught? Now, when you have a school like North or a school like West where there's five teachers teaching English 1, for example, and four teachers teaching geometry, it's important that they are s teaching the same thing. Now, the method is different. The vehicle in which the lesson plans get f put forth to the student is teacher autonomy. They have their own right to teach how they want to teach. But the issue is the same subject matter. So it ends up being an equity issue. I understand how it seems to be kind of counterintuitive. Fluff? Uh, counterintuitive. Because it seems like, well, teachers want to get out of more work. And teachers want to be in front of the students. Whereas most teachers are thinking, I'm spinning my wheels. Because if I'm doing something in my classroom, I have no idea what's going on next door. And how do I know what this student's getting in my class is what the person next door is getting in that class? Not saying that it's the method of how the person is teaching it, but what's the content being taught? And time needs to be built in so teachers can get together and work. So all English 1 teachers dealing with freshman issues can get together and talk and say, what do you, what works for you? Because I'm finding that our students, my students are getting numbers 2, 7, and 10 wrong in the final every year. And your kids are getting that one right. What are you doing in that classroom that's working? And so it may be a shortened amount of time with the students, but we're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs and we're not just setting up our classrooms like Mr. McHugh alluded to. It's more an issue of how can we work smarter and so we're actually helping the students succeed. Again, it may sound like fluff, but that's what research tells us works. That's what other districts have found success with in doing. And that's what other schools of our size and districts of our size have found success in meeting the needs of their students. I, I'm confused, and so I want to just stop and ask a question here before we go on, because I, I, I need to have cl this clarified. Of course. The, the school day, the face-to-face -face days were shortened, but mm. the school day was lengthened. Correct. Correct. Was the amount of time in front of the students, is that part of what got lengthened? Or did the school, school day get lengthened in some other manner? No. No. Actually, class periods. Class period months. times got added. And again, in the previous Isn't area, it within seconds? Oh, two, Doesn't it break down to seconds a min, day? Uh, well, the whole school day is... Um, maybe seven minutes a day. Ex sure. Extended seven by two minutes. Seven minutes a day. Does not that, a class. I'm not sure. I'm, you know, it's, I don't it's, really it's want down to like almost seconds, isn't it? Well, it I depends. Mean, I mean, at the high school, we can only respond for us because we don't know how the elementary school's day was extended or, or whatever. And their days but are probably different than high school days. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I think the, they're, they're broken up into periods in high school right. where elementary has kind and of a yeah. continuum and of activity. And if the middle school right. is a particular house, then it might be a different setup again. For the high school, though, our day was extended by two minutes. Let me whole day. But it wasn't like added to the passing period. It wasn't added. In fact, lunch was shortened by a minute. It wasn't like it was added in the in But what the does two minutes time. mean in instructional time? And I does that make up five whole days? I guess that's, see, that's my point. Sure. My, my beef was not so much with what teachers get paid or things like that, um, because I think in many cases teachers are underpaid. But my beef with the face-to-face -face instruction days was if the State Department of Education says you will instruct our students, our, 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 our children, what have you, for 180 face-to-face -face instruction days, mm -hmm. then that's, I feel, what it should be rather than adding two minutes to each day because out of a hundred and, let's say, 191 days, what your contract is, will a couple minutes a day multiplied times that make up five whole days. Mm -hmm. See where I'm, where right. I'm going with right. that? And, and, and it's I don't a reasonable know. question, and I sure. know that people... I, let me give you a teacher's perspective on it, I guess, as I'm looking at it. You know, first of all, on the question of in-service, I, I, as a teacher, I love being in front of the kids, working with the kids, teaching the kids. Any, most teachers you ask, they would rather be in the classroom with the students, not at in-service, okay? The value of it is, and you know, we're going into a new uh, in-service uh, method or whatever, whatever you want to call it. The way we run in-services, and and I believe it's going to benefit our children um, because 
when you look at, let's take the freshman failure rate, and you're talking, and, and we know it's unacceptable. You know, we don't accept it. We know that we're going to improve it and we're going to uh, attack that problem. How do you do that? You're talking from going from eighth grade to ninth grade. When you start looking at a teacher's day, you know, teaching, okay, average teacher five, for high school, I'm speaking high school, I mean middle school and elementary are a little different, but they're just as busy. Um, I'm putting, you know, five hours a day you're teaching, five classes a day. Uh, generally, you're going to pick up an extra duty like a study hall or in school suspension or something like that. It leaves you, you know, an hour, your other hour to, you know, prepare lessons, make copies and things like that. You're not getting the uh, time, one, to to address some of these problems with, say, middle school teachers to find out, okay, what's going on in eighth grade, okay, as the students are moving up in the ninth grade, how can we um, improve eight, what we're doing in eighth grade, what we're doing at, at ninth grade to um, increase student achievement and alleviate this uh, freshmen that are failing, you know, one class or more classes. Um, that's one thing. Um, you don't have that contact time between each other uh, whether different schools or even in the building. You know, very seldom do I have any time during the work day to go uh, meet with teachers in my own department or teachers that are teaching, you know, the same students that I have in class. That's one thing. Um, you know, if you want to take a business perspective, you know, they're always pulling people out for training sessions, you know, sending them here or there or, or trying to improve on what they're doing in the workplace. This collaboration, and I know you don't, you know, you're kind of like, well, don't like that term, but. No, I, <laughs> collaboration is fine as long as it, you know, we're producing results. Right, right? and, and that's know. exactly, and that's why I, you know, I, I, I buy into this. And, um, you know, there's a ton of studies out there, and, you know, the collaboration has helped improve student achievement. But it's going to give us, you know, going through it, it's going to give us the opportunity to address district goals and needs and building goals and, and when I say building I mean students looking at how are our students doing where do we need to focus attention mm -hmm. to help them improve. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that I have for you Dave mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about you know there's six different teachers teaching English one mm -hmm. obviously not necessarily in both sure. high schools what of have course, you yeah. but um, you know isn't there a curriculum that is set up for English sure. one and you kind of, it's, it's outlined, this is what you're going to be teaching, you're sure. going to go through the revolution or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever subject it is, English one, we're sure. going to talk Shakespeare this semester, we're going to talk this another yeah. semester. Is that not germane to? Well, actually, it goes farther out than that. There are, st um, there are state standards that the state comes up with. Um, this is across the country, but Wisconsin has a certain set of standards that every student should know within the K-12 school, um, their, their experiences in K-12. And it's everything from, uh, how many are there? There's dozens and dozens of these standards. <laughs> right, hundreds. That, that are out there cool. saying everything from being good citizens to being able to compose a paragraph. I mean, it's really as broad and as uh, particular as, as those. Within that comes a curriculum. And so there's this state, um, there's federal, state, local mandates, guidelines, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. that are kind of hanging over Mandates, the top. Yeah. Exactly. For lack, for lack of a better word. And then within the school um, district, there's a curriculum set up for both high schools, curriculum set up for middle schools and for the elementary, as far as what kind of stuff should be taught. And obviously it can't be as detailed as you must teach this on Monday, this on Tuesday, because right. then teachers would have be handcuffed and they couldn't do anything that would play on their own strengths. And so, for example, like an English one or a U.S. history or a physics class has a certain curriculum to find that meet certain standards and certain benchmarks that measure those standards. And so faculty members need to get together on a regular basis to reevaluate does their curriculum meet those standards? And do our finals and do our tests and do the products they're producing in a lab meet those standards on those benchmarks? And so that has to be built in because students change, life's change. And so what, when your daughter was at West, what face classes she took are probably changed different than when Tom's daughter is a freshman. And it should. And so teachers have to get together and talk about it and say, man, we've been teaching the Tempest in English too. It is not working. These kids aren't getting it. Can't we teach this instead and get the same information to meet these benchmarks, to meet these standards? Yes, C they can. Can't, can't, can't these things be discussed 
Um, During faculty meetings. Well, that, not, that, I mean, that just, was going to be my question. Not just faculty meetings, but, and, and I can only draw upon my experience. Of course, right. just um, like we can, yeah. same thing. Being a council member for as long as I was, w we had a lot of participation by citizens' committees, sure. volunteer <laughs> committees who came in and said, you know what, you're not doing this well, but I think mm -hmm. if you did this, that, and the other thing, this, sure. would, this would be more conducive to what you're trying to accomplish. Definitely. There was no days off of work that they took. They came in on their own time. Sure. They helped us devise a plan, an objective, a goal, set down the goals, get us sure. to where we need to go. Can teachers not do that? Teachers, ca teachers can't, can't get together on their own time and say, you know what? And then there are teachers that do. There are teachers that work outside the contract. We were talking. Um, before the taping, how much time we put in that's outside of contract. And you're going to find that nine times out of ten, teachers going beyond their contract day. Um, I worked all summer. Um, there were constant teachers in the building, getting things ready, getting organized, meeting outside of contract, um, teachers meeting during hours of the day that they're not, they should be doing other things and getting together. The thing is that in order to make it work, all teachers have to be there. And I'm not saying the teachers who don't work out of contract are bad teachers or bad professionals that's a different situation. The thing is, is that you want everyone on the same page and you have to have ownership for all, everything. And if you build it into the workday, it's going to be set up. Just like any other employee that is it's, it's publicly funded, if they're going to work outside their contract, usually they get overtime for it or they get paid an additional or they get comp time or whatever you want to call it. But they're also not only working 174 and a half days a year. The thing is though, if you're doing 174 contact days, when they go home, they're still grading papers, still setting up curriculum, still making parent phone call contacts, email contacts. There's still outside trainings, things that go beyond it. The idea that a teacher only works from the <coughs> time that the bell rings to the time it ends, turns it off for the night, I'm not sure if that's fair for the, fa for the staff in this district. Now, we could all name names and say we know who leaves at times. And, and or, it, but I, I'd argue that teachers are doing more than 174 hours, and I don't think taking away the five 174 days. I'm sorry. That's all right. 24 <laughs> and a half, well, excuse me. Um, <laughs> if they're cutting down, it's not that they're trying to get out of the work. I think they're trying to make their jobs better. Well, and go ahead, Tom. A couple sorry. of points, <laughs> you know, to be, because we're not in front of the students, does that mean we're not working? You know, I don't, if, if in-service um, is done correctly, I don't consider that not working. We're there with uh, very focused goals, and the, the end result is to take a look at how our students do are doing, where we can improve what methods, we can improve um, our teaching, okay, and improve student achievement. All right, so I don't, I don't consider that not working. Are there going to be um, measurable goals, though, to these, to these, to these in-service days? What kind of measurable goals sure. are you going to have that say, you know what, we spent this time so mm -hmm. wisely that here okay. is quantifiable sure. evidence that you not only got your money's worth, but we're actually doing a better job than we ever thought we were going to do. That's exactly that's right. segue, actually, into what. Okay. And, and that's exactly what uh, trying to set this up to do. Because you can look at the freshman failure rate and you can measure that. Um, there's uh, obviously test scores that we're, people are going to look at. Um, I don't know if you know a lot about federal law, but there's a No Child Left Behind Act, which is requiring more collection of data like this. Uh, and as we go through, there's semester tests. Now I know in both high schools require semester tests. So you know you can go through item by item, you know, and, and the teachers in the department give the same semester test. And you know if Cheryl was a teacher and we're looking at you know the Russia unit and my students didn't do so well and hers did great, okay, what's going on there? What are you doing with your class, even though we're on the same schedule of when we're doing units and everything else, mm -hmm. what are you doing with your class that they're outperforming mine, scoring better uh, in that unit? And then, you know, that way to share some of those. Now, you ask, don't you have time to do that? Well, f between buildings, you know, I use the freshman failure rate, it's almost impossible to try to get, you can't get people together during the, the day, you know, during the contract day or whatever you want to call it, the school day, um, you know, for me to go and meet with people at Traeger. Now, just to give you an idea, what's my day like? I mean, I usually get there early. Um, uh, right now I have a, I go and supervise ISS on second hour, which is, in, is in school suspension. Okay. Okay. 
So I actually knew what that meant, which should scare <laughs> everyone. So did I. I actually knew what that meant. So did I. But <laughs> well, that says something for me it's that I hadn't, right? It's where you don't want to be. Goody <laughs> two-shoes. Apparently, I never was. Um, you know, so you have that duty, and, you know, and then I teach, a, I have two classes in the morning, and I go back. I do have an open hour. Uh, lunch hour, I, I uh, supervise intramurals. So, I mean, I go right out the door from fourth, or I go right down for, I eat my lunch fourth hour. Um, go down, supervise intramurals, and we, we bring in, we open two gyms up, and we serve a ton of kids that otherwise probably uh, might be, you know, with open campus or something, um, wouldn't have anything better to do, uh, don't get the opportunity to participate in other athletics, and they're down there in this program. I mean, I would say we have one of the best intramural programs in the state. So I go do that, come back, and I teach fifth, sixth, and seventh hour. Then I go and coach. I mean, this year I haven't coached football for a while, but they've, they're going to have some retirements, and they had some co uh, other coaches that moved out of the district, took other jobs elsewhere, and they needed some help. And uh, I always loved football, and it's that time of year, and, and I came back and helped out volunteering. Um, the rest of the school year I coach uh, high school wrestling and then uh, go to middle school wrestling at, over at Traeger. So, I mean, you know, if you're, you're going from uh, 6, 7 in the morning till six at night if you're coaching, where in that school day is there time built in to try to do that? And, and we're putting in hours outside. Of, well, you know, when you say, you know, when you say 174 and a half days, it's 191 days we're working, but we're putting in, teachers are putting in hours at home in the evenings, correcting papers, setting up lesson plans, mm -hmm. you know, doing research on what they're going to sure. teach. I mean, you're, you're, even though like it might be f whatever it is, 1,500 hours total for the contract time, they're putting in, you know, at least another 300, for more hundred or whatever more it is hours. Well, well, I guess, w Tom, when you said, you know, if you're you're doing all these other things, and I mean, you're not just teaching, you're volunteering time, but you're also, do you also get paid for your extracurricular coaching? Yes. So, uh, some, yes. some of the yes. coaching, some say like wrestling, some, yes, football, yep. no, because you volunteer, yeah. correct? Correct. 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 So. I guess my question is, is it, it, I understand and I certainly do not want to sound like I'm unappreciative of mm -hmm. you giving of your time because let's face it, th these are things that all go along with the high school experience, the Definitely. sports, right. the extracurricular sure. activities. It's, it's all important. They're important. Yeah. But if you have to prioritize and you have to choose between academic excellence or extracurricular activities mm -hmm. and you have to choose between do I have an opportunity to talk to my peers about doing a better job in my discipline, which is social studies and geography mm -hmm. for you, Tom? Correct. Or coaching. I mean, do you see where I'm kind of trying to go? Oh. I, I appreciate the fact that you're putting in an awful lot of time. But coming from the other side and looking at this from a totally different perspective, sure. not being in the teaching career, I'm looking at it like, okay, that all sounds really nice, but in budget crisis and budget crunch, I've been required as a taxpayer to prioritize my bills, to prioritize my life, to prioritize my expenses. Mm -hmm. I expect the same from my school district sure. and from my teachers. So it, it's great that you want to do all that, but if I have to make you choose or ask you to choose, I want you to be, be the best social studies teacher right. and the best geography teacher and if, gee whiz, we don't have a great football team that sure. year, mm -hmm. sure. well, I think, and gee up, whiz. One of the issues I think that comes up is we're, as a school district and as a city and anything that's publicly funded, you get pulled in different directions. Mm -hmm. And so the business community might say to us, well, we want to make sure that the graduates of Oshkosh High Schools are going to be good employees and show up on time, be courteous, do customer relations, and be computer literate. And so we kind of get pulled in that direction saying, well, we'll prepare for that. Then another group of um, our society will say, we got to make sure we're fiscally responsible. So you got to cut, trim the fat, why are you replacing this and getting new this? So, okay, we'll lean this way. Then we have groups saying, we got to make sure they're going to be good citizens and vote and take part in community, and so you should do more community service. Then we get pulled in this direction. Then we have parents that will say, well, my daughter better go to Madison, and she better be a doctor, so you better do better academics. Okay, we'll get pulled in the academic direction. And then you have the community's manufacturing saying, well, these kids don't know anything about uh, automotive or electronics or, or uh, woodworking, so we get pulled in that direction. And then test scores come out and get published in the paper, 
why aren't we doing well academics? And then we, oh, we better start teaching more so we do better on these tests because that links to funding. So then we go in this direction. And then we end up, well, the freshmen are failing. Then we get pulled in this direction. So depending on who um, is saying you should be doing this or this, we can't please all people all the time. And so we get spread so thin that where do we set our, our priorities? And so again, you said, the taxpayer, you want him in there. But another taxpayer might say, yeah, but my son, only chance of going to college is, is, is a being a scholarship for football. Exactly. So you better have a good program and a good weight room. Okay, yeah. we'll do that. And so who, who do we respond to? Do we shoot for the middle and hope that we can please most of the people? Or do we shoot for the upper end and, and hit those kids? Or shoot for the lower end so everyone, it's, you know, I, it's, I, it's nailing jello to the wall. It I stick. appreciate that everybody's getting pulled in different directions, but... I guess just kind of sitting here and, and thinking about this and, and listening to what's being said, mm -hmm. you know, we all are probably around the same age, 30s, 40s. Um, Some of us later 40s than we others. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go there. <laughs> um, since I'm probably the oldest one sitting at this table. Um, but, you know, we grew up in a time when I think we did as much as we're doing now, if not more, with less. And maybe it's time for our school districts, administrators and faculties alike, to say, you know what, all your pushing, prodding, and pulling be damned, we are going to focus on academics, and here's how we're going to do it. Maybe we start maybe we need to start kind of going back to some of the basics. Oh, I, I think we need to go back to basics with a lot of things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, morals and, and what have you. But that, too, is another show. But sure. I, I think we need to stop letting some of these these groups pressure our school districts oh, so that we can focus on quality education sure. because other countries are passing us by. We're losing our labor force to mm -hmm. other countries every time you turn around. Mm -hmm. And the country is going downhill academically. And I would venture to say, and probably I think accurately so, that I am probably smarter than most of the people coming out of your school district. Let me go, let me go back. When I graduated, I was probably smarter than some of the people coming out of the school district right now. And that was with less. Mm -hmm. And I'll get off my soapbox. Sure. But why I, do you? Why do I, you? Can I ask you? Why do you feel that way? Why do you feel you know making that? Because so when you came out of school to a student coming out now, why do you? Um, because I see an awful lot like of you know stupid that? kids out there. <laughs> you know, pure and simple. Well, I mean, and that's we've about shared as, our opinion. Quite. <laughs> that is about <laughs> as okay, honest online, as I can. Yeah. <laughs> and and they're dumb acting when they get to college. Yeah, now the, may, they may have a lot of smarts sure. upstairs, but they certainly don't act it. I've you know. I see a lot of college students. Oh, sure. <laughs> day in and day out. And we see a lot of forty-five-year-olds doing stupid. Yeah, and aren't college stuff. students always dumb when we're doing <laughs> stupid if things? I, 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 I just yeah. don't think they don't seem to exhibit the same kinds of common sense and and intelligence that my graduating class sure. seemed to come away with. Well, I think I think if I can as I put a counselor spin on it because I'm a counselor, it's, it's what I do. It's what I do. <laughs> I mean, if I didn't do it, I'd be out of a job. Um, Good kids making stupid choices, I think is the best way of putting it. Our kids are still good kids. Sure. It's just they're making some really, really dumb decisions. And so they're still at heart good kids. Mm -hmm. And sure. so I never and I, meant to imply sure, that. Of course. I just want to clarify for your viewers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if, if I and if you think about it though, um the same problems have been going on for years. You know, if you go back um, and look at drinking issues and sexual activity and some of the stuff that's facing kids, we're just seeing it younger than ever before. And so it's the same stuff's going on. It's just it's hitting them in middle school and elementary. Sure. And we, that's a whole other show as well about Oshkosh trends in those yeah. areas. But if you like, would dissect a, a typical class here in Oshkosh, 25 kids, 30 kids in a classroom, you're going to have about three or four kids. They're going to have individual edu education plans set up. They have some kind of disability, something going on that's affecting their learning. So the teacher has to respond to that and meet their individualized needs, which is state mandated, but we should anyway if they need special treatment. Mm -hmm. Outside of the coin, we'll have kids who are three or four kids in that same room of 25 who are off the charts academically, and you have to do enrichment things for those kids. Otherwise, it's not fair for them. So they're still quote unquote special. This is a different kind of special. Then you have about four or five kids who when they do show up, really don't want to be there. And so the teacher's spending a lot of time corralling these kids, keeping them on task, so the other kids' um, education is not affected. Then you have a bunch of kids in the middle who are decent kids trying to get along, but in the background, they have family issues, 
mom and dad are going through divorce, alcohol and drug stuff personally or at home, you name it, that are just kind of in the background that's affecting their learning every day. And a teacher has to keep those plates spinning on, on the poles, like Ed Sullivan show, to make sure nothing falls mm -hmm. while trying to get through the curriculum that everyone has to agree upon while meeting these state mandates and these federal mandates. But Dave, isn't it true though, you talk about special needs kids and gifted kids and, and uh, kids who are having family issues. We have counselors in school to deal mm -hmm. with the family issues. Sure. We have special education teachers who are dealing with the special ed sure. kids' needs. We have gifted and talented programs for the gifted and talented. Aren't those needs being divvied they, they, up they, by those, a, a variety of different teachers? Very few people do it. Um, counselors took a big hit. We lost a bunch of elementary counselors. Uh, we lost, um, Wes is going up in enrollment. We lost a tenth of our counselor. We had 4.6 counselors and we had 4.5. One of our counselors spends half time at four point five counselors. Oh, somebody salary. rotates. Yep. Oh, okay. So one of our counselors is um, half time at West, half time at Roosevelt, and so she goes from elementary to uh, high school within the work week. Um, elementary got cut. Um, gifted and talented got cut. We used to have a four tenths time person at West um, who was gifted and talented. No more. We have one coordinator for both high schools. Um, special ed. Like Dennis, when he was here, said you can't get good, qualified people in special ed. We have wonderful staff now, but they're way overworked. And their paperwork alone could fill up a whole school year. And so, yeah, we have these resources. But when you're starting to take away some of these support people, school nurses, psychologists, social workers, counselors, and putting that onus back on the teachers saying, okay, now when Billy's crying because mom came home drunk last night, or Susie's upset because dad got fired, the counselor may not be around because that's her day at the other elementary school. That teacher's got to, while teaching this class of 22 first graders, take time to make sure she's going to be okay for the day. And so going beyond that, we have kids coming up, they don't have breakfast, they don't have proper clothes on, don't have coats and mittens. And so we spend a lot of time parenting these kids because they may not get parented at home, or they do and they just don't choose to listen to mom and dad. See, so that just bothers me that, that you're doing parenting in class because I think some parents need a swift kick and oh. excuse my language, the ass. Yes, I agree. I with mean, you. I'm sorry. Is that beep? No, no <laughs> it won't be, but I probably will get a letter from OCAD, but oh well. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to speak to that because when, you know, we, you, you've, ta you've covered a couple of things here, and I want you both to feel like you can jump in here, okay? Okay, we'll do. Um, you, you talked about cuts to positions, okay? Just real quickly, I want to interject. In the cuts that have been that have come to pass in in this last budget cycle, mm -hmm. do you agree with those cuts that the school board has made, or do you disagree with them? You want to go? <laughs> <laughs> now that was chicken. <laughs> no, I'll go, but I, I don't want to be like well, I'm just, talking the whole time. I gotta go a step back. You know, I'm not sure. You know, when we grew up, I think that society and the world has changed a lot. I mean, there's a lot of you know different types of problems out there, and maybe you're right. Maybe over the years, schools have really ended up adopt, trying to adopt too much, whether it was forced on us or not, you know, because, you know, maybe years ago we didn't, you know, we have character education now and we have, you know, um, b besides preparing kids for the workforce, for, for tech schools, for college, um, you know, citizenship and all those other things where, you know, my dad handled the character education in, in that, and I'm not sure... And, you know, usually like, a stick about that line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. School, <laughs> school was easy. I didn't want to go home if I screwed up yes. at school. Yes. Um, you know, maybe that's true. But my experience as a, as a teacher and people are, you know, our kids changed a lot because they're like, how do you deal with them? I, I really don't see a huge difference. And maybe it's just because I'm working with them every year. But 95, 99, whatever it is, percent of our kids are are good, hardworking kids doing their best, and there's some you know there's some screwed up backgrounds out there. They're coming from some screwed up homes and things like that, and they're carrying all that baggage with them into the school and stuff. And it you know you can't teach them until you deal with that because they're I think not we ready. Baby but them, though. but there's a lot of it, people who are screwed up though, in the world. Then you know? Why are so many students failing? I, I guess that's that's where I'm coming from, sure. Tom. Is that if, if we're doing such a good job, and I'm not beating up on you guys, but if we mm -hmm. as a school system, as a society, are doing such a wonderful job in educating these kids, and they may be the best kids on the planet of the earth, or, or on the face of the earth, and they may have hearts of gold, but they are failing. 
and we as a society are somehow failing our students, our children, I think. And maybe it is that the school districts have tried to take on too much. It's I don't know that we have yeah. any more problems now than we did back in. in yeah, we do. And uh, in my opinion, the one we big problem is parental responsibility and accountability yes. and cooperation between the teachers and the parents. Mm -hmm. We're not it's the a, enemy. It's a great point because the number of parents who come to conferences drops off dramatically when they hit freshman year. Yes. They don't come anymore. And the parents that I see at conferences are the counselors walking around are the kids who are doing well. They want to make sure the kid's ready for the next step. Um, not we, we were just talking about that earlier today. And, and not saying that parents that come who need help, what I found, and I tell this when I, when I guest lecture at the university in the counseling department, you know, what's the most surprising thing about your job? How much time I spend parenting parents? How do I deal with my son? He doesn't come home at night, or my daughter won't do her homework. And here I am, I don't have children yet, and I'm giving parenting advice because they see us as the experts because I have 423 kids assigned to me. And they know that I see high school kids day in and day out throughout the year, throughout the summer, and they know I'm working with them. And we fill in that role because parents are looking for, how can I get help? And Rather than doing or, that, though, in, in the table of organization in the school, sure. on the work day, on the taxpayers' doles, why not facilitate parents' groups? The parents that come are the parents that don't need it. Well, that's, that's the sad part. You, but I'll tell you, as a parent who had a daughter that was challenging, sure. And as I was challenging to my parents, you feel somewhat isolated because it is embarrassing as a parent to talk about, and I'm a, I'm a strict parent. Mm -hmm. I, I'm hard-nosed. I mean, I don't think I've ever looked to be soft in any fashion. Sure. Um, and it's embarrassing to admit that um, you, you need help, you, you've lost a, a, an element of control, you need to connect with other parents who are going through the same thing but are having the same problem. They don't want to talk. I, I mean, they, right. they don't feel as though, I didn't feel as though, me going to the school was where I needed to go. Sure. I needed to talk to my husband. I needed to talk to other parents. Sure. I needed other parents to talk to me about what they were doing creatively, much mm -hmm. like you're talking collaborating exactly. with other teachers. Right. So why not use the school mm -hmm. structure mm -hmm. And the connections, because obviously if you have a freshman class, all the parents are genuinely dealing with similar of course, things. Of course. Why not set up parents groups that say, hey, guess what? Here's a list of parents who are interested in chatting, who mm -hmm. would be willing to have talks with you, who've been there, done that, or even a parent like myself, who's been there, done that, the kid's now off to college and sure. we're doing okay. <laughs> sure. but, but that I could talk to them and say, you know what? I remember what that felt like. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I know what you're going through. Here's what I did that worked. Here's what sure. did that didn't work. You know, take with it what you want. And take that off your back. A mentoring sure. kind of thing. A, sure. a mentoring. And, and they are so, coming so to you. So you do a support parent. collaboration. I support <laughs> collaboration as long as, it's not, as long as it's not affecting negatively sure. the impact yeah. of our, our major goal and objective, and that's to educate, educate our yes. children. And and not to, um, you know, and I think you're, you're right about being, you know, because it's going to take everybody. I sure. mean, just, you know, me being in the classroom one hour or the student being at school seven or eight hours a day or whatever isn't going to turn around everything that happens before school or after school. And you, and can't you know, fix you got to work. Home you know, in, in, in a 50 minute class. Yeah. And, and part, you know, so everybody's got to work together right. to try to, to do what's best. Now, um, you know, how do you do that? And I think that's what, you know, everybody's trying yeah. to figure out. And I think we're on to, you know, a better way. Sure. I really do. Well, um, the other thing is, you know, all the doom and gloom, I know you're talking about the failure rate and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a new problem. It's unacceptable, okay? But it's a new problem. I mean, it's really been, just found out about it last year. And now we're starting to fall. It's really not a new problem. It's, it's an old problem that's just been right, that right, you just right. you just track. And and I've been taught exactly. And I've been talking to other districts, and they're saying, "Wow, you know, I'm sure glad Oshkosh is in the paper because if you our percentage is yeah, higher. If they ever yeah. if they sure. ever well, zoomed in on us, you know, we're the same. You know, and um, when you say our students are failing." At least the freshman Many failure of them rate. Are. Yes. They're failing one. It could, you know, most of them are failing one class. Okay, uh, 
maybe two out of a seven for freshmen, out of a six or seven uh, hour class. Now, why is it, you know, we've begun to address mm -hmm. some of those issues, like could it be that they're getting placed in the wrong class? You know, and our, our administration did a great job of going through every freshman schedule and looking at their where they were at eighth grade and saying, hey, are they coming into a, a math class they're not ready for and we got to go back and, and get them into the right class? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it a transition problem where, like what I was talking about, between the schools, they're, they're doing it this way in middle school and all of a sudden, wham, you know, the freshman gets up there and they're hit with this whole new system, whole new way of doing something, and, and they're lost. I mean, is it the size? Because now they're going from a smaller uh, middle school into a school of 2,000 students and, you know, all of a sudden you're, I mean, the hallways are, are packed and you, and you feel and the, lost. And the sense of freedom. I mean, you go from a closed yeah, yeah, campus exactly. to a completely yeah. open right. where you're amongst a huge class. And more electives to choose from. And, sure. And, and, and all of a sudden stuff. you're given all this but freedom. But those were, I mean, I mean those problem. existed back when we were in but high school. But if they Schools tracked, as big when oh, we were I'll there. tell you what, if they tracked freshman failure rates as far back as when I went to school, and I'm not telling anybody when that was. You'll be able to figure out soon. <laughs> I can tell you that our failure rate was equally as high, sure. if not higher, than what the kids are doing now. And, and I think it has a lot to do, and again, this is just my personal, because I was a screw up in school. I was the worst student. Attendance record that, and, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this because it, I don't want anybody to get the idea that somehow I'm proud of that. Sure. I'm, I'm speaking because been there, done that again, and have a little experience of, you know, how I got away with it. Um, the open campus is overwhelming. You go from such a structured environment in middle school. Mm -hmm. You know, you know who your English teacher is. You know who your history teacher right. is. They know who you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, they know where you're supposed to sit, and you better be sure. there. To a high school class that is so big and so voluminous and all this freedom in an open campus, and you're how old? 13 or 14 years old? When 13 or, do you remember 13 or 14? I mean, really, sure. brain damage. I mean, it, you have absolutely no decision-making skills mm -hmm. whatsoever. So how does anybody figure that you're gonna be able to make good, solid decisions sure. like, I think I'll go to class today. Sure. I think I won't go to A, B, and C lunch, but rather just A, which sure. is supposed to be mine. Well, let me, let me clarify, for the viewers who are watching who aren't familiar with how we're set up, with open campus, that just means a lunch hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, because some the other school districts are open campus, meaning you can come and go whenever you don't have a class. And so they are assigned to a, a, a place to be. Um, and an English teacher, for example, um, or associate teacher will have 150 kids on average um, per day, and they tend to have a pretty good relationship with them after a while. In fact, as a counselor, I'm envious. My 420 kids, hopefully, I get to know them, but it's not possible for me to know all of them. Um, and then it, that comes down to again with that that cold disconnection with the faculty ends up being an issue of money. I mean, if we could afford more teachers, have smaller class sizes, that'd be a utopian society. But we don't. We have to do with what we have to deal with, and so that's in there. But I want to go back to, if I may. About 15 minutes ago, you made you asked, yeah, had a comment. <laughs> about and the budget cuts? Before that, actually. Oh, okay. You're talking about data-driven. And you're mm -hmm. saying it has to be a goal in mind. That we're not just having this time to talk to each other about what we're doing in, in uh, geometry class. It's actually a goal in mind. And over the summer, um, we had data retreats in the district. And so each school had a group of 10 administrators, staff, faculty, that worked for two straight days pouring over the data, test results, attendance issues, um, um, final exam scores and all that kind of stuff and kind of poured over the data for a lot of schools the, the very first time. You get these results back from these state tests and they kind of sit on a shelf and they put in a binder. But staff sat down and looked at it and came up with goals that met the needs of the students, found the gaps, but also identified the strengths to say, hey, we're doing good work, we could do better work, and then came up with, with goals for the building. Those in-service times that we built in this year are based entirely around those goals and saying, hey, you know what? Kids who are um, lower economic status are not performing well in these tests. What can we do to meet their needs? Um, students are not doing as well as they should in certain areas. And Oshkosh, we're blessed. We got good students performing at or above the national and state averages in these tests. But still, why are we going to stop there? We got to keep working forward. So every in-service deals with, I'm going to work with my colleagues in a certain department and focus on how we're going to meet these goals. Set up, come up with objectives, measurable things. So at the end of the year, when you go back over and say, wow, 
look how far we came, or wow, that didn't go anywhere, and then set goals for the following year, which is different than the old model of in-service where it was just you sit and get. You sit down, someone talks at you for three hours, and you go, oh, I got a nice folder and a new pen, and now I'm going to go home. It doesn't help me at all. This is where the tire meets the road. We're actually talking about what are students not doing well in, how can we make it better? And in that way, it's going to actually help students and help set up a system. So if it ends up, you know what, these kids need more support programs, then we set up more support programs. Well, if, if our issue, and, and I do want to go back because I did ask both of you how you felt about the budget yeah. cuts that have, that have happened to this that. point. I was coming No, back. I know, but we didn't get an answer, sure. and I'm, I'm kind of funny that way. <laughs> if, if we are talking about not just quality education, but the quantity of education, mm -hmm. because I just don't think 174 and a half days a year is enough educational time. I mean, sure. I just, that face-to-face -face time, uh, it just doesn't seem to suffice when we've got such heavy competition over in Asia and Europe who are mm -hmm. doing far more hours of class face-to-face -face sure. time, sometimes in, in certain areas, year-round school. Mm -hmm. And how do we compete with that? So, okay, I if my issue is the 174.5 days, and you're saying, hey, listen, we need this collaboration time. DPI is saying 180 days is the bare bones minimum. Is there a reason why we can't do more than 180 days? And then the 180 actually be the bare bones sure. minimum? And again, is it just because we can't afford to pay you more days a year to teach? That's part of it, and I, we can only again res our perspective on it. And another show could be great with the union rep who would actually tell you exactly how that's all figured out. The union reps that. and I probably would not get along. We would <laughs> well, probably have a sparring match at some so point. I'd be wearing a striped shirt and a whistle yeah. instead of my yeah. eye on Oscar. The comedy shirt. sports. Um, <laughs> but um, that's the question, and and you can come down and you can split hairs. It could be. 300 days contact, or it could be 100 days of contact. But it ends up being, again, what's happening. And making quantifying it, making it an objective number, is just as slippery as trying to qualify it and saying what you're doing in the classroom. And I know I'm being fluffy with you. Because yeah, you really are, Dave. Because it ends up being <laughs> 174 and a half days, and how we use it in the high school, again, versus a teacher at, at Jacob Shapiro, it's, there's so much individualized things that need to be done at a certain school. And the way it's set up now is instead of having these, we have district mandates, each school is doing what needs for their students. And we may need these in-service days this year, and then look and say, you know what? Next year may not need something different. And there's, there's talk of different ways of playing with it. Because, again, you're talking about how European schools and Asian schools are outperforming us. There's research saying why they're outperforming us. And there's more to it than just how many days they're in the classroom. It's how they're teaching, what they're teaching, what their approach is. How Tracking. They're tracking, all that kind of stuff. We need time to sift through that and apply it. But this isn't anything new. I mean, it, It's the, not anything the, new, but now, now, like you said before, the freshman thing, we're shedding light on it and we're exploring it. We've always known it, but we haven't had time to even So what have we been spending it. our time on? If we're, not, if we're not shedding light on the fact that freshmen are failing until just recently, sure. and we're not shedding light on the fact that the Europeans and Asians are beating the hell out of us in mm -hmm. education, and we're not shedding light on the fact that we're not having enough face-to-face -face time, what have we been spending our time doing? It comes back to what we were talking before about how we're getting pulled by different groups. And again, and there's different groups where all of a sudden, you know, Sputnik went up, so everything's got to be science and math. Got to compete with the Russians. You know what I mean? And everything else kind of went by the wayside. And all of a sudden, the feel good times came, and we got to make sure everyone feels good about themselves. So they structured yeah. curriculum. Or and so it, society changes, so schools have to reflect it. We're, we're so, mirrors. Of so society. let's go back to real quickly, because we're, we're <laughs> running out of time, and I, I, there is so much stuff to cover. Yeah, there is. Um, Invite us back, Melanie. It, well, and I will. And if you need to bring the union rep, you know, just wear helmets. Um, yeah. Us or you? Do you no? <laughs> you bring one for him and a flak jacket will work too. Um, <laughs> did you agree or disagree with the budget cuts as they, the ones that have taken place? And of course, you know they've cut 1.7 million already out of the budget, mm -hmm. and there's a tentative another 1.7 mm -hmm. million, depending on where the state falls out. Sure. Have you agreed with the cuts so far? Yes and no. How's that for an answer? Yes, because... You're doing the fluffy thing, the fluffy Dave. Thing. Yes and no, because yes, because it needs to be balanced. It needs to, the, um, we need to make sure we get, again, uh, fiscal responsibility. You know, in a way, because we're using this business model and students aren't customers and there's not a set product that needs to be completed. And so 
there's more to it than how much for this? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. There's the meat and potatoes of it. And a lot of times when it's a budget thing, it's just a skeleton. There's more to it. And you said before, getting involved with parents and making sure their voices are heard. A lot of times their voices aren't heard as much. And a lot of times it's very intimidating going you know, on cable access television and talking to the school board, and they don't feel that their voices are being heard. And so, yes, I agree with some of it, because some of it needed to be trimmed, I'll be honest, from my perspective. And no, because some of the trimming took places in areas that are already hit hard enough, like media. Um, like custodian and building services, like people services, like counselors, nurses, social workers, and psychologists. And we're taking some things out that you don't see an obvious result from it, but they have so much impact on the school system, on parents, on families, on community, and on, especially on students. And so I'm saying no to that area, but yeah, there's some stuff that needs to be trimmed. Tom, what about you? Uh, I don't know all of the cuts. I mean, most of them. I, I think this next round is really going to be the tough round because yeah. that's where you're going to really have to make some judgments on you know, what's, what are our priorities and where are we going to go with this? Um, you know, I think everybody, they kind of took a little bit from everybody, mm -hmm. I thought, mm -hmm. as far as that. Yes. I mean, as probably as fair as it could be. Yeah. Um, nobody likes to see it, you know, anything being cut, but obviously that's the times we're in and that needs to be done. Um, this next round, you know, uh, you know, it's, this is, it's this gonna is going to be painful. the tough one. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and it didn't end up being larger classes less resources for students, um, less services available after school and during school for kids. And then parents are gonna say, well, how come I don't have this available for my daughter anymore if my older son had this? And, and will there be more user type fees as well for certain things? There's a chance, but um, some board members don't like user fees, even though a lot of districts in the state use them. And so we have to kind of figure that out. And again, out of the top 20 largest school districts in the, in the state, we're 20th in spending. And so we wanna buy a $20 steak and spend 250 for it. Mm -hmm. and there's got to be some decisions, not just at the school level, but at the community level, and what they want to support. Boys. And it's not, you know, and it's not all doom and gloom. No. I mean, we are we're, we're in one of the best states in education in the country. Our district scores are are always uh, above the state average. You when know, you say district scores, are you looking at the ACT scores? ACT uh, and, and WKCE, WKCE. The standardized WKCE. test scores at fourth, eighth, and tenth grade. No, does that mean we can rest on that? No, no. I mean obviously okay. not. We no, want to no, keep getting better and improving. What about when we talk about student scores? Mm -hmm. That's that's one element of education. Exactly. What about teachers being tested for competency? Would you do you think that's a good idea? It opens a can of worms because who develops the test? And uh, what do these results mean? If the tests are there and they end up saying, how do you improve? Um, and this is what your, your, your gaps are, like we test students, then personally I think that's a good idea for everybody, not just teachers, but anybody working with students. If it ends up being an issue of um, score a certain percentile and the, what, uh, it's something more arbitrary, then it's an issue. But if it ends up feeding back and again providing like that net mirror, how do I improve, then by all means. But it's, there's so many more cans of worms with that one that I don't know, you open up the Pandora's box. And on that note, testing. I'm going to have to okay. end it. I'm sorry, oh, we're cool. just about out that of time. Like a, wow, we could go on. We could go on. We did oh, not get an opportunity to cover whatever else you felt that maybe oh. needed to be covered. So I'd like you to, uh, I, I'm inviting you to put those things down did on, we miss a lot on email of and to get them to me oh, in email. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you guys for being Thank here. Thank you. Thank you very we'll much. We'll see you next time. Take care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on us. <laughs> you got four, four pages. I typed it all myself, and I'm the world's worst typist because I do this. That's sure. because I wasn't in Mrs. Warple's class enough. <laughs> um.